guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. So good to have you join us on this latest episode of Behind the Charts. Our second season is filled with some incredible conversations. So far, we've talked with guys like Peter Brandt, Mark Chaikin, some incredible, knowledgeable technical analyst traders sharing uh, some of their words of wisdom, uh, battle scars, and, uh, and learning uh, lessons learned over the course of successful careers. My conversation today was fantastic with Helene Meisler. Helene was the first technical analyst at Goldman Sachs. We talked about her start in the industry into the 80s, 90s, 2000s, when she did things like, uh, you know, worked with uh, Jim Cramer, uh, first at Goldman or, and talked with him about Goldman uh, and also uh, started uh, as the technical analyst for TheStreet.com and RealMoney.com. We talked about her start at Cowan & Company, where she worked for Justin Namus, who's an incredible technical analyst, wrote some of the best books on, uh, on technical analysis, particularly how to sell and how to think about taking profits and managing risk as a, uh, as a technician. She's continued on a career that, is, uh, that has spanned the globe and uh, even today continues to publish on social media her hand-drawn charts that she should c continues to update every day after the close, tracking key stocks of interest. Enjoy this great conversation with Helene Meisler. So Helene, it's fantastic to sit down with you today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you, I, I think I would, I would imagine you are a person, an, a technical analyst that many people know. And I told you when we spoke before, I feel like in, I think of you as a mentor because I think you were one of the first online writers, authors of technical analysis that I followed consistently from your, I think from the, the street .com, from real money days, early 2000s. Yeah, uh, I guess so. I mean, it, you know, it's it's so funny because I'm so technologically disadvantaged. I'm just, I'm not a first adopter type. And so when I look back and I think that I started writing on the internet in the late 90s yeah. about the market, it's, yeah. you know, I look like a first adopter, <laughs> but I'm really not. <laughs> well, let's start, let's start even earlier on, start at the very beginning. Where are you from originally? New York, born and raised. And, very good. Um, yeah, very good. And um, I went to work on Wall Street in 1982, which was, I got my timing right there. That's, that's interesting timing if you know your market history, right? That's the 82 low just before 83 breaking out. So what was that like? I'm, I'm assuming that was your introduction to the financial markets or were you following? A yeah. No, 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 no. I don't think my parents even owned bonds or stocks. Right. And um, I went to school for marketing okay. and uh, I actually went to work in a marketing research firm out of school and it was a terrible job market. You know, you're probably too young to know, but 1982, it's a terrible job market. Right. And um, in, in the fall of 82, I sort of had decided that this marketing research thing wasn't going to work for me. And I went to a headhunter who said to me, oh, you should really go work on Wall Street because the market had bottomed in August. And all of a sudden, after a 10 year bear market, Wall Street was looking for people that, you know, they didn't really even care. <laughs> all you needed to do was be willing to learn. And so um, she said, she said to me, I've got this stack of, of jobs, entry level jobs at Wall Street firms. I have nothing anywhere else. <laughs> I said to her, oh God, I finance is not my thing. But she sent me on some interviews. She said, let's just see how it goes. So she sent me on interviews and um, I ended up interviewing a Cowan and Company um, on the, <laughs> this is kind of funny. Uh, she sent me on Wednesday before Thanksgiving at four o'clock in the afternoon. If that wasn't like the ultimate Friday afternoon <laughs> interview that you know they're not really interested, but they're oh, just yeah. going to talk to you anyway. <laughs> but it, you know, obviously, it turns out the market trades until four o'clock. Nobody really wants to sit down and talk to you until then. Anyway, um, they made me an offer, and I went to work at Cowan. And, and um, Cowan and Cowan. I mean, if if people don't, I was going to ask you about early mentors, but uh, like guys like Justin Mamis come to mind who were you know had successful careers. Like, who were your early mentors as you were getting started there? So when I first started, I was in the institutional sales area. Oh, okay. And I worked for the, part, the partner in charge of the New York sales area. And um, uh, I don't know, maybe about a year or two after I got there, Justin Mamis came to work for us as our technician. 
And um, he was just the kind of person who was easy to talk to and what he did was so interesting. And so I found myself spending a lot of time with him. Like I'd wander into his office and ask him questions. And, um, and, and so in the mid eighties, I asked if I could go work with Justin. That was what I wanted to do. I really wanted to learn what he had to do, what he was doing. And um, I have to say, you know, in terms of jobs, it couldn't have been the, probably Cowan was the best place to be at that time because we were small enough, but big enough. Yeah. And, um, and they were so nice to me and they let me go work with Justin. That's fantastic. And it, it was fantastic. And so I, I, you know, I consider myself just blessed that I was able to, you know, work with him for so many years and learn everything that he knew. And not how, everything. And when you, if, if people that don't, I mean, some of the, some firms that have, have been around and not been around for a while, people are not familiar with them. Cowan was not a technical shop primarily, right? It was a, it was a technology research company, right? Right. In, in, um, Cowan was originally, they were bond people. Got it. Okay. And they had a re, and they had a retail business, retail mm-hmm. stock business. Um, And then sometime in the 70s, they bought um, G.S. Grumman, which was an institutional technology research firm based out of Boston. And that was our institutional department. So we were basically, if you were, remember, this is the 80s. I mean, you didn't, most firms had a technology analyst. (laughs) And that was it. One. Okay, you know, Cowan, we had the semiconductor analyst, the semiconductor equipment analyst. We, you know, we had a mini computer analyst, a mainframe computer analyst. I mean, so if you were trading technology stocks, you kind of had to do business with Cowan. Mm. Um, so, but the whole macro thing in terms of having a strategist and technician and everybody had them, but it, it wasn't nearly the, the kind of departments like, Alan Shaw had at Smith Barney, um, you know, or, or any of that sort of, or Bob Farrell had. I mean, th- those were the technicians of the 80s. I mean, they had massive departments. Yeah. I mean, Justin had me. <laughs> <laughs> but you had an opportunity to learn from what I would think of as one of the greats of technical analysis, to be honest with you. That's, that's very fortunate. And then what, tell, talk through your career from there. And then at some point you rotated to Goldman Sachs, right? Right. So in um, in 1989, uh, I got a call from Goldman. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was from their head of administration of trading, of equity trading, mm-hmm. and and I had met him years earlier because he had worked at the New York Stock Exchange, and I had just met him through other people. And um, he called and he said. Goldman is looking for a technician. We've never had one before. Would you be interested in coming to interview? So I said, okay. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, bet, the world was different then. First of all, Goldman was a partnership then. I don't even think they even had a, a female partner. Maybe they had a hundred partners and that yeah. was it. Um, and um, also people went to work for, at Goldman for life. Yeah back then. I mean, nobody really, you didn't really know of anyone leaving Goldman. Right. And the only person I knew who had left Goldman was Jim Cramer. Mm. He, had, he had set out a couple of years earlier to start his own hedge fund yeah. and had become a client of Cowan's. And so I used to talk to him about charts and technical analysis all the time. And um, so I called Jim and I said, okay, I have to ask you, you know, Goldman's asked me to interview and, and Jim in his way, oh, you have to do it. You have to do it. You gotta do it. And it'll be great. It'll be wonderful. And, and then he thought about it. And, and, and again, we have to remember the time. Yeah. And he said to me, just don't be concerned. You're probably going to have 17 interviews before you get to see a partner because you're a woman. Right. <laughs> And so um, I went for my interview. Well, two days before my interview, two days before my interview, I get a call from the guy who called me originally and asked me to put together a chart of General Motors and 
quote unquote, do whatever it is that you do. Okay, so yeah, I drew in some lines. And anyway, they sent, <laughs> this is my favorite part. They sent a runner over to pick it up. I was like, I'll fax it to you. Yeah, you know, it shows you how old I am. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and so um, I said, no, I can fax it. No, we'll send a runner over. So they sent a runner over. Two days later, I show up and you know, I think the Dow, I mean, I can't remember the S&P because GM was part of the Dow then. And I think the Dow is probably trading at maybe 2,500, right. some, something like that. So you have to understand it was, you know, it was 10 times lower than it is now. Right. So <laughs> for a stock to move a dollar yeah. was a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal. Like you, know, like you could hear traders on the phone going, oh, IBM's up a stick. I mean, you don't even hear that now. A whole dollar, right? <laughs> a whole dollar, and and so um and and for for a four and GM was trading in in the forties, so for a forty dollars stock to move a dollar was a big deal. Yep. And you know, and this is before we traded in decimals. Mm -hmm. So um, I show up, and I meet the admin guy, and he says to me, "Okay, so I'm." I'm on the trading floor. And he says, okay, I'm going to take you over to see Bob Mnuchin. I, you know, I, I, if I had a picture of my face, I'm sure it was like, uh -huh. <laughs> because Bob Mnuchin was the head of all trading at Goldman Sachs. He was the, maybe right. the number three partner. And I'm thinking, Jim Cramer said I would not meet a partner until I have gone through 17 interviews. Okay. So, um, they bring me into Mnuchin's office and it's this fishbowl in the middle of the trading pool floor. It's all glass. And um, before I could even sit down, <laughs> Mnuchin says to me, so I'm long 100,000 shares of motors here, General Motors. Nice. And I looked at him again, I'm sure like <laughs> in shock. And, you know, first of all, I come from Cal when we were in trading blocks of 100,000 shares. I right. Mean, and the market was just so different then. And um, he and and he said, aren't you the one who said if it goes to 42 and a half, it's going to 46, 47. Uh, you know, yeah. And, and he says, well, if you're gonna work at Goldman, you're gonna put your money where your mouth is, have a seat. And I sat down, I, I gotta tell you, I know I think I sweat through the entire interview. I was saying my because I was thinking, just hearing you describe this. <laughs> and I and I know I'm sitting there thinking, oh God, what is GM doing? Give me a Quotron. What is GM doing? Um, anyway, we had a very pleasant chat. I mean, he was, you know, we barely talked markets. We just we talked about a lot of interesting stuff. And anyway, I met one other partner, and that was it. And I left. And they called me, and anyway. It was a Friday, I remember, and GM closed up two and three quarters on the day. And I spent the weekend thinking, I have got to have gotten this job. There's no <laughs> way I didn't get this job. And I got called back the following week to meet some of the other partners and people on the desk, and then they made me an offer. So, um, that, you know, sometimes you just think the market gods are in your corner, <laughs> right. and, you know, because I got to tell you, I don't know that I ever had a great trade like that in my life since. <laughs> I'm just it's a but, good time yeah. for one of those. So what, how long were you at Goldman Sachs then, uh, you know, reading the charts for that team? So I spent about three years at Goldman. Okay. And um, uh, the markets were, the business was in, in flux and changing and- Sure. Um, and by that point, by 1992, um, Justin had left, um, had left Cowan and gone to this Canadian firm mm. that he'd been at, I don't know, at that point, a couple of years. And he, I, I think it was like my first month at Goldman, he was calling, come work with me, come work with me, come work with me. <laughs> and so, you know, now it was 1992 and Justin was probably into his sixties already by then. Right. And he, and he called me and he said, just come work with me. I really want to do this and I'm probably going to retire not long after this and then you can have the whole business. Yeah. It was enticing and so I went. And um and it was fun. I mean it was really fun but I didn't we didn't stay together 
longer than maybe another year when I got called by one of our clients who was Cargill, uh, had an equity trading business. And, um, and they called to ask if I would be interested in coming to um, trade stocks for them. Mm, okay. Which was an opportunity I wasn't going to get anywhere else. You know, right. b- doing what I was doing, I was just going to stay as a sell side technician, which sure. was fine. But this was sort of an opportunity that presented itself. And so I went, I packed my bags and moved to Minneapolis. And I've right. not moved back to New York since. <laughs> <laughs> despite so the accent of, despite yes. the accent Dave <laughs> so you left New York and joined Cargill now at some point you reconnected with uh, with Jim Cramer and started writing for thestreet.com when did that all happen right so I spent three years at Cargill okay. and I also met I met my husband in Minneapolis very good and um, he was with Cargill in their grain trading business mm-hmm. agricultural commodities and um, he got transferred to Singapore in 1996. So I quit my job and went with him. And um, I'm sorry? No, very good, go ahead. Oh, yeah. And um, so, so, you know, we moved off to Singapore and I thought, well, we thought we were only going for two years. And I thought, well, I can just sit around and do some trading and, you know, whatever. I'll get a job when we move back. Mm-hmm. And um, in 1997, Jim Cramer started the street. Mm-hmm. And so he sent me an email and said to me, I've started this. Well, we had kind of hooked up through email before that. And then he said, oh, I started this venture at the street.com and what do you think do you want to just give it a try write for us one day a week kind of keep your hand in the game I said that's not a bad idea I mean I was doing all my work anyway and so I did and I started so uh in January 98 I started one day a week I quickly went to two days a week I went to five days a week and I've never stopped now and uh and we ended up actually spending five years in Singapore. Right. And from there, from there, we moved to Shanghai for four years. So. Wow. Um, and now back in, uh, in Missouri, right? In St. Louis. I am. And then we moved to St. Louis and we didn't know how long we'd be here. And 15 years later, we're still here. Still here. So, you know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now called uh, Bull, a history of the boom and bust from 19, I think it's 1982 to 2004. And it talks about this whole period that you've just described from your time at Goldman, moving to Singapore, uh, starting to write for thestreet.com. Can you talk about that period in terms of the market environment, particularly when it got to the later stages of the you know, early 90s, late 90s, when you had all these signs of euphoria, what, were, what was your experience covering stocks and, and obviously with the background covering technology stocks during that period? So, you know, I only because of so many of the excesses in today's market, we we have a strong tendency to look back at 1999 and try and see similarities. Sure. And yes, I'm not going to say there aren't similarities. I mean, excess is excess, and you know it doesn't really matter if it's excess today or excess 20 years ago or excess 50 years ago. It's all going to look the same. Yeah. But there was something different in 1999. The um, the breadth of the market peaked in late 1998, early 1999. Right, right. And if, if you go back and you look, it is literally a steady downward trend, just constantly, day after day after day after day, because 1999 was all about speculation and a narrow group of hot stocks Yeah, going up, you know, just like they, they looked like, Tesla until recently, you know, <laughs> um, or or a lot of them look like GME from yeah, that's recent. Right. That's right. Yep. Okay. And so it was hard. I would say it was very hard to time that. Yeah. The the bubble bursting there, but you knew it wasn't right. You knew <laughs> it wasn't right because there were you know the market was just getting narrower and narrower and narrower every single rally it was narrower and narrower i mean even the number of stocks making new highs just continued to go down and um 
along with breath. You know, it was pretty clear that um, the Dow peaked in, um, in January that year. Um, the S&P was pretty laggy. So uh, that was very different. Um, and probably a little closer to the 1973 high of the Nifty 50. Right. Where breath had been so bad and you just had a handful of stocks that were going up every day. What we have, you know, and so when you come to today's market, that's not what you have. Mm. You have pockets of hot stocks, but you don't have a lot of stocks in downtrends like you did back then. Yeah. So, I, you know, um, aside from that, I have to say that um, what was unique then to the late 90s was the big change in commissions. Mm. I mean, we, we went from high commissions to, you know, $10 a trade. Right. We went, which now sounds ridiculous, but, right. <laughs> you know, um, we also moved from trading in fractions to trading in decimals. Yeah. And that was a big... People probably don't even understand, but that was a big change. Just think about it like this. Um, for a stock to be up on the day, it had to be up an eighth or down on the day. It had to be up an eighth yeah. or maybe a stink, but really a lot of no stock, not a lot of stocks traded in, in teenies. So, you know, you had to be up on up. That's 12 and a half cents. For a stock to be up today, it has to be up a, a penny. Right. Or even and that changes... Right, and that just changes the nature yeah. of, of trading for, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, so you're not paying more to trade. Your spreads are narrower because they're, they're now, you know, you can have a dime instead of a 12 and a half cents. And, right. you know, so, um, so I think that, that, that I, if I had to look back, I would say that the late 90s was very transformational mm -hmm. in terms of the markets. When you, you know, when you're looking back at your career, and again, congratulations on this, on this career. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating the, the experience you've been able to have along the way. What, what's a mistake in your career that's taught you the most that you could share with us? Oh, it would be, <laughs> well, it would be not being able to follow a trend. Mm, okay. I am the world's worst trend follower and every <laughs> single time i say to myself i'm gonna follow the trend i'm gonna follow the trend i'm not gonna fade it i'm not gonna fade and every single time you know maybe i stay a little bit longer but yeah. it's very it's very hard to go against your nature yeah <laughs> and having learned from having learned from justin i'm a contrarian by nature Sure. Right. It, it's just, you know, when everybody's on one side of the boat, God, I just want to get to the other side. <laughs> and, and, and so it, it's so hard. I had, I had a, a boss at, at Cargill who used to, and he was just like me. He also liked to play turns instead of, but he always used to draw on the board um, something that looked like this. And he used to say, you don't have to do, you don't have to catch it down here. You don't have to catch it up here. You got to catch this. Oh, yep. And I would say, you're so right. Why can't I do that? <laughs> and so, Why you know, I, I keep that? trying. <laughs> I keep trying. I'm just, you know, I keep thinking someday, someday. It's, it's funny because Justin, who passed away last year, would, yeah. would always say um, he was never going to retire until we got to a low that was like 1974. <laughs> okay. And, and and so and so I often think to myself, I'm not gonna retire until I learn how to play a trend. <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting, right? right. Well, um, so I was gonna ask Which you means about, we probably have a lot more years left. <laughs> it's possible. I was gonna ask you about a transition from manual, you know, sort of the, the uh, you know, Ralph Ekampora had told me how, you know, technical analysts were, you know, really called chartists because a lot of the job was just hand updating charts and maintaining them. And I, Bill Doan, one of my mentors at Fidelity, you know, showed me his old point and figure charts and how meticulous you would have to update all of the charts. 
I was going to ask you about that, but you're on social media still publishing your <laughs> taking screen little snapshots of your paper chart. So I don't have you made that transition or what was that like to I mean, have you how does that fit into your process now today? So here, here's a, a kind of a funny story. When, when I first started working with Justin, he had this huge pile of charts and he would, and Justin worked from home most of the time. He'd only come into the office once or twice a week. He was clearly a man but ahead of his time. Yeah. And he would go through the charts in the office and take the interesting ones home and leave me the dull ones, okay? <laughs> and so my first night of charting, he, I, I, most people don't know. So, so the charts I do are from originally from John McGee and they're semi-logarithmic, which means that um, the center scale must be some derivative of 80 because there are 80 boxes right. above and 80 boxes below. Right. So, which, which is, you know, once you get used to the scales, it's quite easy, but when yeah. you're first doing it, you're, you're calculating everything. It's like, okay, it's below 80 that, you know, that means it's 50, every box is worth 50 cents below every, you know, and, and if you cross the 80 line, you got to change the scale in your head. Anyway, so my first night I sit down and I start charting. And of course you can't start charting until the market is closed. Right. And back right. then you couldn't do it until all the trades were settled and that was at 4.15. So it wasn't like at four o'clock you could start. Yeah. And at eight o'clock, I was still at the office, the only one. And I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. This is absurd. There were computers. I mean, this was, you know, the mid 80s. People no. didn't have PCs on every desk. No. You certainly didn't even have chart machines. <laughs> you know, you couldn't get a chart on a computer. And so, I mean, you know, maybe you had to like slip in a graphics card to get a chart. Right, right. And so, right? So, so I, I the next morning after I'd finished, I came home, I, I came in the office and I called Justin and I said, I think this is charting by hand thing is ridiculous. Right. I said to him, I really think that we can talk to the people in the, the computer department was what we called it. <laughs> <laughs> and and we, we can ask them, I mean, they have all the prices are updated on the computer. You know, we can ask them if they can create a chart. No, oh my God. He, Justin said, no way, no, no, no sure. way. <laughs> there is a certain feeling you get, not just putting the pencil to the paper, but from sharpening the pencil. Oh, and you know, at, at 25 years old, you know, you roll your eyes and you think, oh God, he's old. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. Here you are. Still the age of Justin. <laughs> still um, but back in, going back to the late 90s, uh, yeah. when, when we moved to Singapore and we only had dialogue then, I did notice that there were some websites that had charts. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I can give up charting. And so I put my pile of charts off to the side and I tried to do all my statistics and all my indicators and all that sort of stuff I had to do by hand. Yeah. But the charts I'm going to get on this, this website. Oh my God, I lasted a month. <laughs> and I felt like I just didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. Yeah. And, and so I pulled out the pile of charts and I kid you not, I went back and updated on every single chart <laughs> the month I missed. And I, I have not been able to give it up since. And, and I know, you know, I often get from people, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, you give that up. You you know there were computers now, and, <laughs> but there really is. I mean, I hate this. Justin was right. There really is a certain feeling you get from putting the pencil to the paper every single night. Yeah, I believe it. Oh, just one final question then, Helene. Uh, for people just getting started, learning about the markets, learning technical analysis, what words of wisdom would you give them? Or a favorite saying, uh, uh, a market saying? What would you tell them to keep in mind as they uh, approach these markets? Well, the contrarian in me would say, "Please see my pin tweet." Okay. Which is, there's nothing like price to change sentiment. Mm, I love it. And you know, it's it's just, I I'll, I'll give you the perfect recent example is that. Back in late October, nobody wanted to own energy. I mean, energy stocks were just a pariah. Oh, 
How could you want to own energy? And, you know, an Exxon was going down every single day and there was talk about them cutting the dividend and you just didn't know and how long was the dividend safe? And, well, <clears throat> here we are now and all we hear about is commodity super cycle mm. and you have to own energy and oil maybe is going to 70 or $80. And, and, and you know, what's really changed since November? You know, the price yep. has gone up. Price, yep. So, you know, that's, that's how I look at things. Now, you know, is that, I don't know if that's helpful because <laughs> you probably have to really watch it a lot to know it, but you know, you, you sort of like, like yesterday, you just knew, um, I called um, yesterday a realization day in bonds. Yesterday was the day everyone decided, oh, bonds really matter. <laughs> like bonds, like the entire, the entire rally in yields for the last month hasn't mattered. Yesterday it Today, mattered. Right? <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, so to me, I find that that tends to be, but again, that goes back to me being the kind of person who likes to find the turns, not trade the trend. Not through the trends. Helene, this has been fascinating. I, I really am so thankful we get to share some of these stories with uh, with all of our viewers. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thank you. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.